Welcome to this uh, short paper session. My name is Georges Pierre Bonneau from the University of Grenoble and INRIA in the Alps. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this short paper session. We have uh, five very interesting talks on scientific visualization. We will learn new techniques for improving DVR, visualizing material properties, visualizing uncertain multivariate data, increasing the resolution of vector fields and selecting optimal salient time steps in temporal data sets. So many interesting challenges here. Uh, the short paper session for me is always a place where you can quickly learn new and original ideas and I am sure this will be the case today as well. So we will start with the first uh, talk. And the first talk is uh, uh, analytic ray splitting for control precision DVR. Uh, it will be given by Sebastian Weiss from the Technical University of Munich. And so, Sebastian, the, the floor is yours. Welcome. My name is Sebastian Weiss, and I will be presenting our work on analytic ray splitting for controlled precision dike volume rendering. Dike volume rendering with a fixed step size can be computed very efficiently and works well for smooth transfer functions. But as the peaks of the transfer function get more and more narrow, artifacts begin to occur. These are especially distracting during motion. To reduce these artifacts, the step size has to be reduced, but this drastically increases the computation time. We propose a ray splitting algorithm that can solve these difficult cases without any noise. But do we even need such transfer functions with narrow peaks? Let's zoom into the dataset and switch to isosurfaces. Regular semi-transparent isosurfaces can separate the features very well, but cannot convey small uncertainties in the dataset. We argue that dike volume rendering might be more faithful to the underlying data as voxels with a density a little bit away from this isosurface still contribute to the output. However, smooth transfer functions lead to a loss of small details. A sharper, more narrow transfer function is needed instead. Here is again a comparison between multiple isosurfaces and dike volume rendering. Before we explain our method, we introduce a bit of theoretical background. In dike volume rendering, the task is to visualize 3D volumes as shown here. We start by shooting a ray from the camera through the object and accumulating the colors along that ray. The mathematical model behind this is the so-called volume rendering integral. Let tau be the absorption on the along the way, and let c be the color along the way. The output color is then given by this nested integral. It, in a general case, it has no analytical solution. Our method allows for an efficient and accurate quadrature with a controlled precision. We assume the data to be given on a hexahedral grid. We can split the integral at the boundaries of the voxel and this allows us to process each voxel independently. Within the voxel, trilinear interpolation is used. This gives rise to a cubic polynomial of the density along the way. The transfer function is then given as a piecewise linear function. Applying it on the density along the way gives rise to a piecewise cubic function. We propose a ray splitting algorithm that can analytically compute this piecewise cubic function. Before we explain our method in more detail, we revise some related work that also attempts to solve the volume rendering integral more accurately. Novinson et al. proposed in 1999 a high-quality quadrature method for pre-classified volumes. In pre-classification, the transfer function is applied at the vertices of the volume. 
and these colors are then interpolated trilinearly, giving rise to a single cubic function of the colors along the way. And this cubic function is then solved via quadrature. Engel et al. proposed pre-integration in 2001. In pre-integration, a table of integrals for entry and exit densities is pre-computed. And this table is then queried when a ray passes through a voxel. Note that this method was originally introduced for tetrahedra meshes. In tetrahedra, when the ray through it gives rise to a linear function of the density. And pre-integration is exact in this case. On hexahedral meshes, however, with the cubic function of the density, pre-integration implies a linear realization of the density. This also changes the resulting color of the applying the transfer function. And to reduce these approximation artifacts, a smaller step size is needed again. Lastly, Lindholm et al. proposed in 2013 a completely different approach to direct volume rendering. Here, isosurfaces are drawn at the control points of the transfer function via marching cubes. From these isosurfaces, the accumulated color is then reconstructed. This method can extract sharp peaks in the transfer function very well, but introduces approximation errors due to marching cubes and a linearization in the reconstruction. Now we detail our method and compare it to the related work. Recall that the color and the absorption along the way are piecewise cubic functions. The control points of the transfer function define isosurfaces of the densities, much like exploited in Lindholm et al. In a first step, we analytically solve for these isosurfaces during ray tracing. The intersections then define segments of the resulting function. Then, per interval between two isosurfaces, the associated segment of the transfer function is identified. The density and transfer function is combined, giving rise then to the final cubic function at the current segment. This step is repeated for all segments. With this, no peaks can be missed. Each segment of the ray is integrated individually. Per segment, the color and absorption are single cubic polynomials. We can then apply the quadrature method presented by Nobens. First, the volume rendering integral is simplified. The inner integral can be solved analytically, giving rise to a polynomial of degree 4. The outer integral has to be solved via Simpson quadrature. A detailed study on the quadrature methods is shown later. In our first test, we evaluate the per pixel errors of constant stepping against our proposed method. We use a synthetic dataset of an expanding and shrinking tube at a resolution of 256 to the cube as test case. As one can see, a large step size leads to massive ringing artifacts. These errors can be measured, for example, with RIC curves. These curves plot the allowed per pixel error along to the baseline on the x-axis and the number of pixels that fulfill this error bound on the y-axis. A higher value indicates less errors, as more pixels fall within this error bound. The vertical dashed line indicates an error of 1 over 256, or where the difference would be larger than 1 bit on an 8-bit display. Now the step size is decreased. The error is reduced, but the rendering time becomes very large. Note that the x-axis is in a, in a logarithmic scale. And ray splitting then allows for more accurate renderings in less time. Here for reference, 
pre-integration with a step size that leads to the same time, same runtime as our method also shows large errors. Now we repeat the experiment with a sharper transfer function. The artifacts are even more prominent now and the convergence of constant stepping is slower. Again, ray splitting allows for more accurate rendering in less time. Also in this case, pre-integration performs worse again. Convergence rates can also be compared in a different way, shown on the Thorax dataset of resolution 512 to the cube. This dataset is interesting as it highlights the advantages of dike volume rendering. All peaks in the transfer function have the same small width. For the lung and the bones, this leads to clearly separated surfaces. But the stomach area remains smooth highlighting the high uncertainty and variation in densities there. Now the step size is halved until we'll get a noise-free image. This means the output does not change anymore on an 8-bit display. With the same output precision of 1 bit, ray splitting requires a magnitude less time to render. The same results hold for all tested datasets. For example here, a CT scan of a stack beetle or the ejector dataset, a supernova simulation. For further details and timings, we refer to the paper. Next, we analyze the quadrature methods in more detail. To recall, the integral per segment has no analytical solution and has to be evaluated via quadrature. However, we can compute an, up, an upper limit on a number of quadrature steps. In this table, we show the number of quadrature steps needed in a typical test same. With the trapezoid roll, up to a few hundred steps might be needed. For Simpson quadrature, even for a small allowed error, less than 10 steps are needed for most segments. For this low number of quadrature points, the runtime of the algorithm is dominated by splitting the array at the control points of the transfer function. Using a higher order quadrature brings no advantage. However, computing those error bounds is quite costly. As an alternative, we can use the adaptive Simpson scheme as proposed by Kampagnolo et al. in 2015. The timings we have shown earlier use this adaptive Simpson scheme. The proposed ray splitting algorithm is general enough to allow for several extensions. Grau's proposed with scale invariant volume rendering in 2005 an alternative to standard volume rendering. In this method, the integral is evaluated over the data domain instead of the spatial domain. The assumption for computing this variant, however, is that the density is mon monotonic per segment. This is quickly violated via constant stepping. Here is again the example of the density along the way. If the step size is too large, those segments with a non-monotonic density are not captured and result in errors. With the proposed ray splitting algorithm, we have an explicit expression of the density along the ray. Therefore, we can simply solve for those extrema of the density and introduce additional split points at these extrema. This allows us to render the scale invariant integral without artifacts. Here is a comparison between constant stepping and our proposed method. Furthermore, the emission term can be extended to include additional shading effects, like Fong shading. Analytical error bounds on the number of quadrature steps are no longer possible, but one can still benefit from the splitting at the control points and analytical solutions for the absorption. 
Last, the ray splitting algorithm can also be used for multiple semi-transparent isosurfaces. By combining transparent isosurfaces and volumetric effects around the, these isosurfaces, hybrid visualizations can be achieved. We imagine that this could be used, for example, to visualize uncertainties around isosurfaces. The effect becomes especially prominent when a cutting plane is introduced, as shown here. Here is again a comparison of this hybrid method with and without the volumetric envelope. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thanks you for this very nice uh, first talk. And so um, please uh, feel free to ask your question on the on the chat, on the Discord chat. And so I, I'm uh, from in the meantime, I have some question. First, I would like to make sure I was not I was not completely uh, sure from the talk. Can you actually interactively change the transfer function and do you see the changes in the rendering interactively? Um, yes, everything is interactive. So you can change the transfer function, camera, all parameters. Okay, no. because I, I looked at the table of rendering times. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about rendering times uh, for, for this method? Yeah, so it depends on the on the transfer function because you need, um, because we have the splitting at the control points, meaning the more control points you have, the longer it takes. So this gives an additional scaling. But for transfer functions with a single peak, with two peaks, we can be interactive in full HD on a modern graphics card. Okay, so. great. Uh, speaking uh, on graphics cards, it may, I mean, it's probably not strictly related to your work, but uh, can you uh, can you tell us a bit about your experience with these new modern graphic cards that are available, these new RT, RTX uh, NVIDIA cards for real-time ray tracing? Does it make a big change for you? Yeah, so I don't use these RTX cores. The thing is, um, these RTX ray tracing cores are optimized for triangle, ray triangle intersections. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some works that employ these RTX cores mostly for acceleration structures, but here in this work, we haven't used them. Okay. Um, I see that in the, in the conclusion, you mentioned some future works and I was uh, quite uh, uh, interested by this. So you mentioned uh, something about differentiable renderer us. So can you tell us a bit more about this possible future works? What, what would it be the function will render on, and what would you be able, able to do with this? Yeah, so the with differential rendering, we mean to generate derivatives with respect to the volume or the, the transfer function, for example. And we hope and currently developing exactly these differential rendering techniques. So in this case, these ray splitting with, um, with these controlled precision allows us to get rid of these extra parameter of the step size. The step size with the ringing artifacts would introduce noise in these gradients. Okay, I understand. So because I know that dimension renderers are using computer graphics, for example, in the context of shape of from shading, if you would like to find the shape uh, given, uh, given some shading, then you'll have to solve some, minimize some energy. In that case, it, it's uh, useful to know the derivatives or the differential derivatives from the uh, lighting, from the illumination of your scene. But that's not what you are interested in in that case. And not, uh, not in this case, yes. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Ingrid Hotz. Thank you, Ingrid, and hello, by the way. So uh, I see, could this be easily generalized to higher order interpolation methods? That's a nice question. Yes, it can. Um, it has two problems. So the, the first problem is mostly performance because for example, in cubic interpolation, you don't have just eight uh, vertices in your cube, but you have four to the power of cubes or 64 that you have to keep track of. And the crucial thing is these intersections with the isosurfaces. With three linear interpolation, you have the cubic polynomial that has analytical solutions or 
very performant numerical solutions for intersections. For cubic interpolation, for example, you have a nonic polynomial and you need, we tried it out, so it works with sphere tracing, for example, to find these intersections, but it will be extremely costly. Yes. Okay, okay great. And then thank you, Sebastian, again. Yes. And so that's too bad that nobody can upload. So maybe I can upload alone, but that's... Uh, thank you very much for this uh, very nice talk and answer. So we are on time for the next, uh, for the next talk. And so the next talk is uh, entitled... Okay, so I'm not sure when I was live or not, but anyway, I would like to thanks again, Sebastian, and then to welcome the next speaker. And so the next talk will be entitled Vision Analysis of the Relation Between Stiffness Tensor and the Cauchy Green Tensor. And the talk will be given by Christian Blecher from Leipzig University, Germany. So Christian, the floor is yours. The stress and the strain tensor are two quantities which are well known by engineers from structural mechanics. They tell them how a material reacts under applied forces. That means how will the forces be distributed and diverted in the material and how will the material deform under these forces. The stiffness tensor creates a mathematical link between the stress and the strain tensor and tells the engineers, for example, how great will be the deformation according to the applied stress. The stiffness tensor itself is a fourth order three dimensional tensor, which has 81 coefficients. This complexity and variety of this data could be the reason why it's not so often considered for visualization. In this talk, I want to show you how we used fiber surface to visualize the stiffness tensor and to prove the link between the stiffness and the stress tensor visually. But first, let's look on the stiffness tensor. As I already told you, it's a fourth order three dimensional tensor, which can be represented as three times three times three times three array, resulting in 81 coefficients. Because we assume a hyperelastic material, the tensor has a major symmetry as well as some minor symmetries. This reduces the amount of different coefficients you have to look on from 81 to only 21. The tensor can be mapped onto a six times six second order tensor using the Kelvin mapping because it's easier to um, visualize and to work with second order tensors than fourth order tensors in the moment. Um, we use this mapping especially because it preserves the tensor properties like eigentensors and the inverse. Besides the tensor symmetries, we can also look at material symmetries which are symmetries each material property has itself to even further reduce the amount of different coefficients we have to look at. We only look on autotropic materials or materials with higher symmetries like tetragonal, cubic, transversal isotropic and isotropic materials because the material model which was used to simulate the data set and the whole process only supports these types. Each of these types is at least autotropic, which means we have nine moduli or material coefficients to describe the material. Via symmetries, nine would be the maximum, as for example, an isotropic material only has two different independent coefficients we can look at, or we have to look at. These nine moduli can be diverted into free Young's moduli E, free shear moduli G, and free Poisson's ratios nu. If the tensor is then rotated into its natural coordinate system, these moduli can be calculated by using the inverse of the tensor. So we re reduce the 81 coefficients to only nine moduli we have to look on to visualize the tensor. As for example, we could reduce a second order three dimensional stress tensor with nine coefficients due to symmetries and the principal values to only three values we have to look on. Now let's look on the 
algorithm we use, the fiber surface extraction algorithm we use to visualize the tensor. But before we could do this, we have to look on the basic idea which stands behind the fiber surface, which are isosurface. The isosurface are a pre-image of an isovalue of a one-dimensional codomain in a domain like the three-dimensional physical space. So an isovalue is a point in a one-dimensional codomain and a line in a two-dimensional codomain. So what will be the pre-image of a two-dimensional isovalue? Yeah, it's the intersection of an is of the isosurfaces for both one-dimensional components, which form a fiber. And we could see these fibers in, this, uh, in the current picture here uh, as black bolt lines. If we assume a steady codomain, a line segment in this codomain would form multiple fibers in our domain. And if we connect them, we get a surface. This means a pre-image of a line segment in a codomain would form a fiber surface in our domain. And this whole concept was introduced by Carr et al. Wright et al. extended these fiber surfaces to a three-dimensional codomain. At the beginning, they used tetrahedral grid, where at each point of the tetrahedral grid, they have three scalar values given, which are some set of three invariants of a second order tensor. They use these three values as new coordinates for each vertex in this uh, new invariant space. So they transferred each vertex from their physical space with their physical coordinates to the invariant space with its according invariants and invariant coordinates. So the relation between each vertex will not be lost during this transformation. So they, in the end, they get the tetrahedral grid in the invariant space. As the engineers are interested in selecting regions of interest, they introduce convex solids, which they call them the actors, um, which are only triangulated surface to select these regions of interest. These fiber surfaces are then the intersection of these triangulated surface with the grid. So they clip each triangle against each tetrahedron of the grid, which I think we could all coincide is only a simple intersection calculation. The intersection is then mapped back into the physical domain, which is now the fiber surface. Blesha et al. figured out after I did all that their algorithm does not depend on three invariants of a second order tensor. It could use every combination of three variables, which makes this tensor visualization to a multivariate visualization. And the last step was to extend this three dimensional multivariate visualization algorithm to an n dimensional visualization algorithm, which was done by Blesha et al. in 2020. They combined multiple three-dimensional subspaces of Wright et al. to one n-dimensional attribute space and compared to the extraction, fiber surface extraction algorithm by Wright et al., their fiber surface extraction algorithm not only extracts the fiber surface alone, it also extracts the selected regions of interest. And this means the algorithm could be used in a refinement process where some algorithms are used to reduce a great data set by constraining some attributes and analyzing this smaller data set further with some other algorithms then. As we now know which algorithm was used, let's look on the data. We use a simple block consisting of an initially isotropic material representing soft biological material. A sphere is pushed into this block over time, which is represented by this black arrow. Due to symmetries, we only visualize a quarter of this block. Among other variables, the stiffness tensor and the right Cauchy Green tensor was calculated during the simulation. The deformation leads to the development of different principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor, which results in the emergence of anisotropy in the material due to its nonlinearity. In our work, we calculated for each time step the nine coefficients of the stiffness tensor, 
the three Young's moduli, the three shear moduli, and the three Poisson ratios, plus the three principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor, and use them in our work. The first step was to create an overview visualization to investigate the development and distribution for each of the nine coefficients of the stiffness tensor. And as they naturally fragment into three triplets of three Young's moduli, three shear moduli, and three Poisson ratios, this underlines the applicability of the fiber surface extraction algorithm by Bright Blecher at all even further. So we visualized our n-dimensional attribute space as a combination of multiple three-dimensional subspaces. So we have um, in the upper left quarter of the picture a visualization of the three fiber surfaces which are extracted for each of the three Young's moduli in this part and the visualization of the three-dimensional subspace of the Young's uh, three Young's moduli. In the upper right part we have the same with the fiber surface and the three-dimensional subspace for the three shear moduli and in the lower right part we have the same thing for the three Poisson ratios. The third quarter or the lower left quarter of the picture shows all of the nine hyperplanes in each of the three subspaces which was used to extract the corresponding fiber surface for each coefficient. These fiber surfaces are extracted over time, so for each time step, and in each time step we even uh, extracted more fiber sources by pushing the hyperplane through each subspace in 10 steps. So we are going from uh, selecting regions with low, um, for example, low E1 Young's, um, for low Young's moduli E1, and going then up to high Young's moduli. The resulting video showed that higher Young's moduli are located in the lower left corner of our physical block, where, which is where our sphere is pushed into furthest. This also applies in a similar way to the shear moduli in the Poisson ratios. Our domain expert was sold on this visualization style as he could see and compare multiple distributions at the same time. After that, he mentioned that he is interested in the comparison of regions with high Young's moduli, so high stiffness regions, with the principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor. This uh, could enable the possibility to extract highly deformed regions if elastography is used to measure elastic property materials, uh, which means we have no deformation quantity given due to the measurement and we could not extract highly deformed regions directly. So the first step was to extend our nine dimensional space to a 12 dimensional attribute space by adding the three principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor. Second step, we use another hyperplane to extract regions with high Young's moduli, which can be seen in the lower left part of this picture as blue plane. And the corresponding fiber surface for this hyperplane is shown right beside. As we extract the region with high Young's moduli, we show the distribution uh, in the nine other variables to investigate the distribution of these variables in these regions and compare them to the values of the whole data set. So we could we have here in the low in the upper left part the subs attribute subspace of the three shear moduli, in the upper right part the three Poisson ratios, and now in the lower left lower right part the three-dimensional subspace of the three principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor. And we could see in the dark colors the values which are only located in the regions with the high Young's moduli compared to all values of the whole data set here shown in lighter colors. The domain expert ascertained that increasing Young's moduli coincide with higher values in all other subspaces, but especially with high principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor. 
This means highly deformed regions could also be extracted by looking on high stiffness values, which is the consequence of the mathematical link of the stiffness in the stress tensor. And this means even if no deformation quantity is given and only the stiffness tensor is accessible, we could all also extract highly deformed regions and visualize them in our physical space. During the investigation of the 12 dimensional filter, a fold down lock was identified in the middle of the subspaces of the Poisson ratios and the principal values of the right Cauchy Green tensor. So, a new set of hyperplanes was used to select this region, which led to fiber surface in the lower part of the physical block. Our domain expert mentioned that this could be due to the boundary conditions because the block was fixed on the lower side in the simulation. So we uh, added a hyperplane in the physical domain to extract the lower region of our block and analyze the distribution of the other 12 variables in this region, which proved the hypothesis that this luck would only occur due, due to the boundary conditions. To conclude the talk, we showed that the n we applied the, our n-dimensional fiber surface algorithm um, to a nine-dimensional and a twelve-dimensional coefficient space, which was built of the coefficients of the stiffness tensor and the right coach, principal values of the right Cauchy green tensor. We visually proved the mathematical link between these two tensors. And we showed that the algorithm could also be used to create overview visualizations, to filter and refine data, data sets, to investigate boundary conditions in your data, and to extract highly deformed regions, even if no deformation quantity is given. For future work, some new visualization techniques could be developed because the attribute space suffers under self-overlapping of the tetrahedra and some new visualization techniques could reduce the number of needed subspace visualizations for our n-dimensional attribute space. I want to thank you for your attention and I'm now ready for questions. Okay, all right. Thank you for this very nice talk. So it's it's really challenging to be able to visualize these uh, material properties, but it's uh, it's crucially important in many uh, domains related to material sciences. So very interesting uh, topic. So maybe uh, let me start with one quick question. You found you found a domain expert that you could ask question for. And my experience is that domain expert in material sciences are quite conservative and traditionalist. And so, what? How do you find this person that was reactive to useful and futuristic visualization? And in what domain was he expert exactly, or she? So he is actually one. Uh, one professor at the University at Freiburg, but worked previously at the, what is it, the uh, Umweltforschungszentrum, so the um, Environment. scient Environmental Scientific Research Center in mm. Leipzig. And he provided us with some data for also other papers. And uh, he had in, the, in his repertoire of data sets this um, tensor, so the stiffness tensors, also some other. Um, tissues and so we came back with the idea of how we we want to have a high dimensional attribute space because we if and wanted currently the n-dimensional fiber surface and we want to test them and so we looked around our all domain experts and uh, said so guys we have we want to have some highly dimensional data sets and someone who can look at our data and have okay maybe some interesting things to do and so he came up with this data set so i got it so the, the main point was uh, multivariate data and you found that yeah. uh, in, especially with this fourth order tensor of course you got this this um, multivariate data okay uh, great so you mentioned in the paper that you you restricted to uh, uh, some uh, specific symmetry of the material tensor uh, autotropic symmetry i think is that mm -hmm. right 
we are not restricted. I mean, I mean, you, you, fo you focus, let, let's say you focus on orthotropic. Yeah. And so the question was, could you, could you apply or extend your method to maybe other kind of symmetries like uh, you mentioned tetragonal, uh, transversal isotropies? Yeah, of course, because uh, the, this restriction, as you mentioned, is not really a restriction of the algorithm itself. It's more the convenience to reduce such high as the 81 coefficients to only nine coefficients. So it's the thing uh, we could yeah, use. Yeah. But yeah. I guess there is a problem of scalability at one point. If you have too many variables, too many dimensions, would be the use visualization still be useful in that case? Um, yeah, of course you could, you, because you don't have to look on every combination of each variable, like on a normal and a default uh, scatter plot matrix, because we are only introducing these subspaces we are interested to look on. So, yeah, of course, if you have eighty-one coefficients, it would be quite um, quite important to filter the coefficients we have to look on and it would be quite difficult to make such a visualization with these 12 diagrams um, but in principle we could uh, look on every combination the domain expert wants to look on yeah maybe a quick one because i see we are already out of time it's, it's really it's going really fast so i'm interested in oxytic uh, material which are materials with a negative poisson ratio could your method allow me to find quickly if a material is oxidic in, in what dimension is oxidic? Yeah, it could. You will only have to introduce the coordinate center in our subspace of the Young's Molly, and then we could easily see what part of your data set, because we are transferring all points of your data set into the subspace of the Young's Molly, we could easily see what points are at the negative ratio and then extract them with some interactor and look in the data set where these areas are. I will use it. Thank you again, Christian. Thanks. Okay, so uh, welcome to the next talk. I think in, in the next talk, we will also speak about feature level sets and multivariate data sets. So the, the title of the next talk will be visualization of uncertain multivariate data with via feature confidence level sets. And the presenter will be Sudan Shusain from Ski Institute, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. The floor is yours. Welcome to our presentation titled Visualization of Uncertain Multivariate Data via Feature Confidence Level Sets. My name is Sudhan Shusane, and this work was done in collaboration with Tushar Ataule and Chris Johnson at the Ski Institute at University of Utah. Here is an outline of the presentation. We will briefly look at isosurface-based visualization, followed by the concepts of feature level sets and confidence isosurfaces. After that, we'll take a look at feature confidence level sets, an uncertain multivariate data visualization technique, which is really a combination of the two above methods and the main contribution of this work. Finally, we will go over some experimental results before concluding the presentation. So let's begin by asking the question, what is univariate data? Univariate data can be defined as a single attribute or one-dimensional scalar field defined over a domain. In the example on the right, we have data from a tornadic supercell thunderstorm simulation by Lee Orff, where a single attribute of vorticity magnitude is visualized. The figure here is looking at the domain from above. A common way to visualize scalar field data are isosurfaces. Isosurfaces are the surfaces that represent points with equal value in a 3D data distribution, and they are an extensively used technique. Generating an isosurface involves specifying an isovalue. On the left here is a plot of the probability of vorticity magnitude values in the domain. And then depending on what isovalue is specified, the surface geometry corresponding to that isovalue can be extracted. So if we select an isovalue of 0.4, the figure on the right shows you a surface that represents all the points of the domain where the vorticity magnitude value is 
If you change the ISO value to, for example, 0 0.2, you can see that the number of points in the domain with this value is larger, and thus the amount of geometry generated is much more. And vice versa, if you change the value to 0 0.8, the amount of geometry generated is less. Overall, isosurface-based visualization has proved to be a useful way to visualize features in univariate data. That said, isosurfaces also have limitations. For example, it can be challenging to isolate features that are defined by multiple attributes, that is, multivariate data. And using individual isosurfaces for each attribute can result in occlusion. If we consider this example below, we have two attributes, vorticity magnitude and pressure perturbation. Negative values of pressure perturbation are associated with updraft rotational mechanics of an evolving tornado. We can see that if we want to visualize regions that have a vorticity magnitude value of 0 0.4 and a pressure perturbation value of negative 10 together, you can end up with isosurfaces that occlude the features of interest. There are sometimes solutions like modifying the transfer function, but this is not always practical as the number of dimensions grows larger. Addressing these limitations of isosurfaces for multivariate data brings us to the concept of feature level sets. Feature level sets provide us with a method to visualize features that are defined by multiple attributes. They are the generalization of isosurfaces to multivariate data and were introduced by Jankowai and Hans. At a high level, the method involves the following steps. You have to specify a trait in attribute space. This can be thought of as analogous to an ISO value. Traits can be defined generally as arbitrary geometries in attribute space. Next, you have to derive a trait specific distance field. And there are multiple distance metrics that can be considered. This is actually an open research question itself. Essentially, you want to derive a distance field which provides the user with a notion of how far away from the feature is some point in the domain. The last step is extracting or visualizing le level sets from the distance field in the spatial domain. In this case, a small threshold distance near zero can reveal the points in the domain that are closest to the feature. Essentially, once you derive a distance field, you have univariate data. And then selecting an ISO value near zero should highlight all the points in the domain that are closest to the feature as defined by the trait. Going back to our example from the tornado dataset, let's define a trait as vorticity magnitude greater than or equal to 0 0.4 and pressure perturbation less than or equal to negative 10. This trait is shown using the green rectangular selection in the scatter plot, which in this case is the two-dimensional attribute space. Then we can compare what we visualized before or if we used a custom transfer function. And finally, to the visualization when using feature level sets. Here, we are able to isolate the feature that is defined by the trait. In this case, we are only visualizing what I'm going to refer to as the zero level set. This is the result of extracting a level set from the distance field using a small threshold value. Now that we've looked at how we can visualize multivariate data, let's look at an uncertainty visualization technique. This next relevant concept is confidence isosurfaces. This is a confidence interval-based uncertainty visualization method for isosurfaces and was introduced by Zena et al. In their study, they also look at multiple other ways in which uncertainty information can be conveyed. For example, using glyphs, as shown on the left. In this talk, we are interested in the visualization on the right, which shows semi-opaque isosurfaces that are computed on the basis of some confidence interval. This approach provides an intuitive understanding by providing different shapes of isosurfaces due to uncertainty in the data. To understand how confidence isosurfaces are computed, let's consider a notional example. There are four 6x6 grids. The two columns of the top row show the mean and standard deviation values defined at each grid point for a single attribute. In this example, an iso value of 5 is used. The dotted line in the mean grid shows the iso line for the value 5. For a given confidence interval, in this case 68%, you can use the z-score to compute the lower and upper bound 
of the interval for each grid point. The lower bound at each grid point is shown on the bottom left, and the upper bound is on the bottom right. These grids also show the isoline for the value 5. Generating isolines using these lower and upper bound values can give you an envelope around the median isoline, which is shown in the summary plot on the right. Having discussed feature level sets and confidence isosurfaces, we can now understand feature confidence level sets. Feature confidence level sets is an uncertainty visualization technique for multivariate data. It is the generalization of confidence isosurfaces to multivariate data via feature level sets. Similar to feature level sets, generating feature confidence level sets also requires specifying a trait in attribute space. It also requires deriving a distance field, and it requires extracting a level set from the distance field in the spatial domain. Whereas feature level sets compute a distance field based on the distribution of a function in the domain, feature confidence level sets additionally consider the uncertainty of the function, which we in our study represent as a distribution at each grid point in the domain. And we have to also consider some confidence interval value. Overall, for our study, we assumed mean and standard deviation is defined for each dimension i in attribute space. Second, we consider a limited definition of a trait by considering only intervals for each dimension i in attribute space. So our trait can be defined as for all i there is an interval from li to ui, where li is the lower bound and ui is the upper bound. Lastly, as our distance metric, we computed distance fields using the Euclidean distance transformation in the spatial domain. Thus, for each grid point, the derived field encodes the minimum distance from the feature defined by the trait. To give you an overview of the approach, I want to bring your attention to the notional example on the right considering a single attribute. The first column shows the mean and standard deviation for a single attribute. The top row shows the process to compute the distance field for the feature level set or in our case, the zero level set ZLST for the trait T. When computing the distance field in the spatial domain directly, the approach differs slightly from when the distance field is computed in this attribute space. The basic idea is you first compute a binary volume to mark every point that satisfies the trait. We use zero if the value at the grid point intersects the trait interval and one if it does not. This is followed by a Euclidean distance transformation to produce a distance field. Using a small threshold distance near zero, the zero level set can be extracted. The bottom row shows the process to calculate the feature confidence level set. Here, using the mean and standard deviation and specified confidence interval, bounds can be computed at each grid point. You can then generate a binary volume that indicates whether the bounds at a grid point intersect the trait or not. This is similarly followed by a Euclidean distance transformation, which I note is not shown in this figure since it happens to have the same values as the binary volume for this example. Finally, using a small distance threshold near zero, the feature confidence level set can be extracted. Next, we will look at experimental results for four datasets. The Tangle Function Analytical Dataset, an EF5 tornado dataset that we've looked at previously, the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden eddy ensemble data, and lastly, an ethane diol molecule dataset. For all of our results, we visualize the feature level set that exactly matches the trait using an opaque isosurface. This is essentially close to the zero level set. We then augment it with the feature confidence level set using an isosurface colored with the same hue and 25% opacity. We label the feature confidence level set as FCLS with a subscript showing the confidence interval value that was used. We used visit to extract and render smooth level sets using the pseudo color plot and isosurface operator. Overall, across all the datasets, the shape of the feature confidence level set corresponded to the uncertainty of the data in the spatial domain. For the tangle function analytical dataset, which is a data set that has these initially disjoint blobs that link together as you increase the ISO value. When you introduce uncertainty, 
it is highest near the links between the blobs. And so our trait was specified to highlight this feature. As expected, we found that the feature confidence level set envelope expanded between the links in response to increasing the confidence interval. But the envelope did not significantly expand on the exterior of the blob itself where the data shows less uncertainty. A close-up of the feature confidence level set for different confidence interval values can be seen on the right with the confidence interval value increasing from top to bottom. For the tornado data set, we specified a trait using three attributes related to vorticity. In this case, the feature confidence level set visualized weaker vortices in the proximity of the primary vortex that satisfy the trait criteria. And you can see the feature confidence level set envelopes become more prominent for nearby vortices as the confidence interval increases from left to right. For the Red Sea and Gulf of Aden data, we specified traits that would allow us to visualize anticyclonic and cyclonic eddies. The mean and standard deviation for this data were computed by considering data from 20 ensemble members. So in this case, besides showing larger regions of eddies in the Gulf of Aden, that is on the top right of each figure, the feature confidence level sets visualized possible existence of additional eddy tracks in the Red Sea across ensemble members for this specific trait definition. These are not seen in the feature level set visualization alone for this trait. In the ethane diol dataset, electron density and reduced gradient are related exponentially in regions where no chemical interactivity occurs. In the scatter plot, this corresponds to the main separating axis that can be seen. Our traits are selected in attribute space and are off this main separating axis. Our trait selection thus corresponds to regions with significant chemical interactions. In the figure labeled ZLST, the blue level set corresponds to the covalent bonds, the green level set to the non-covalent bond, the red level set shows you the oxygen atoms, and the yellow level set the carbon atoms. Interestingly, we found that feature confidence level sets of individual traits visualized boundaries of non-chemical interactivity for each feature. Looking at figures labeled A and B, these show the feature confidence level sets formed in closing structures primarily around the bonds. And similarly, in figures C and D on the right, the feature confidence level sets are observed in regions of influence of each atom. But we notice that the semi-opaque yellow level set surrounds the oxygen atoms as well. And although not visible, I can tell you that in figure C, there are feature confidence level sets of the oxygen atom occluded by the level set showing the carbon atom. This essentially conveys the proximity of the traits in attribute space, the uncertainty in the data, and also some of the challenges pertaining to trait definition to isolate features. To conclude this talk, we've contributed an isosurface-based uncertainty visualization technique for multivariate data via feature level sets. We also demonstrated our technique on multiple data sets. Feature confidence level sets visualized regions of uncertainty in relation to a specific trait and visualize secondary feature structures based on uncertainty. There are multiple challenges for future work. These include considering various sources and models of uncertainty. For example, how can we visualize the uncertainty of data compressed using a technique like ZFP? And also the visualization of interquartile ranges for uncertain multivariate data. With that, this concludes the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Sudanshu, for his very interesting talk. Um, maybe a first quick question. Um, so what would be the advantage of using your uh, uh, method, multivariate uncertainty visualization, with respect to visualizing separately the different variables with their uncertainty? How, how would you uh, concretely state what, what the difference would be? What would, sorry, can I, can I ask? Between, between on, the, on the one hand, use your multivariate uh, visualization method with uncertainty, and on the other hand, visualize separately the different variables with their uncertainty. Ah, that's an interesting question. I think the most relevant reason why you'd want to visualize it together is certain features are only defined by multiple variables together. For example, in the last data set that we looked at, 
there were four features which were the carbon atom, oxygen atom, and the two types of bonds, the covalent bond and the non-covalent bond. In that data set specifically, you can only really visualize or really isolate two features, which is the oxygen atom and the non-covalent bond when you visualize two attributes together. So trying to visualize them individually would not even reveal those features to begin with. So there are certain features which require multiple attributes. And so in that context, then if you want to visualize the uncertainty, how would you do that? You would need to be able to have a technique which works for multiple variables. Okay. Uh, what would happen if you say you have on one variable, you have a lot of uncertainty and on the other variable, you have absolutely no uncertainty. So what happened in that case with your method? That is a very interesting question. And something which is, uh, I think it's, the way that it's phrased in the context of feature level sets, it's called like a discernibility issue. So you don't always know what the contribution of individual attributes is to a distance field. And so that is something that can be worked on. One, one way to address that problem would be to uh, have local coloring or some sort of texture mapping done to the surface, which can help you address which variable maybe contributes to that uncertainty. Uh, I think one of the limitations in this context might be that the more attributes you have, the harder it becomes to distinguish which attribute or have a good visual representation of conveying that information. But this is an uh, ongoing research area, which we hope to make some contributions to as well. Okay. okay. Then we have a question from Ingrid Hotz. The computation of the proximity to the trait requires a metric. Did you consider alternatives to the Euclidean metric in attribute space? So, we did not consider a different, uh, we did consider Euclidean distance, but our work actually looked at if we could complete that Euclidean distance in the spatial domain directly. Most prior works of feature level sets have computed the Euclidean distance in attribute space, which is one way of uh, deriving a distance field. By computing it in the spatial domain, I found pros and cons to that approach. Uh, one, Pro is that it could support use cases where someone wants to think of a distance in the spatial domain, which is sometimes more intuitive depending on your domain or the problem you're solving, versus thinking of a distance in Euclidean distance in attribute space isn't necessarily always as intuitive because your attributes can have very dynamic and different ranges. For example, one attribute could go from zero to a thousand and another one could vary between zero and one. So distance field derived in that case would be dominated by maybe the first variable. So we did consider a different distance field. We'd consider it in the spatial domain. Whether there are other distance fields that can be used is yet to be seen. And whether there would be something which is more intuitive to understand for a user is also an interesting research space. Great. So we are going a bit out of time. Thank you, students, uh, again for this uh, very nice talk and question and answer. Yes, thank you so hey. much. You're welcome. Okay, we are almost on time, four minutes uh, too late, so that's okay. So the next talk will be uh, 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 in entitled Integration Aware Vector Field Super Resolution. we got some machine learning right there, I think. And the uh, presenter will be uh, Saraj Sahu from Vanderbilt University. So the floor is yours, Saraj. Hello everyone, my name is Saroj and I will be presenting our work Integration of a Vector Field Super Resolution. Vector Field Super Resolution refers to the task of uh, recovering high resolution vector field from its low resolution counterpart. In scientific computing, scientists uh, usually run large scale numerical simulations on different HPCs, generating enormous amount of data. The usual workflow includes transferring these high resolution data from the HPC to a local computer for analyzing the data. In practice, however, the file I.O. acts as a bottleneck in terms of storage space and network bandwidth. This motivates the use of vector field super resolution techniques. If we can recover the high resolution vector field from its low resolution counterpart, then we can overcome the limitations caused by file I.O. Interpolation techniques like trilinear interpolation can be used for super resolution. 
However, they fail to capture the global flow structure since they only use local information for upsampling. Deep learning based techniques, however, have proven to be a better alternative and outperform these traditional interpolation techniques quite easily. In deep learning based super resolution, we downsample the uh, high resolution vector field to generate the low resolution vector field which is then passed as input to a network which outputs the super resolution vector field. When designing the loss function for deep learning based techniques, intuitively we would want to optimize for the content loss. One way to define the content loss is the Euclidean distance between all the um, vectors of the super resolution vector field and the ground truth high resolution vector field. However, a common limitation to this type of content loss is that they don't take into consideration how the vector field is actually used in practice. Specifically, uh, scientists usually integrate these vectors to uh, generate streamlines and visualize the streamlines to understand the flow behavior of the vector field. The key advantage of using a deep learning based approach is that we can optimize for what we ultimately visualize, that is the streamlines. We present integration aware vector field super resolution, where we take the integrated streamlines into consideration while performing the optimization. For a ground truth, uh, uh, for a given ground truth, uh, high resolution vector field and a super resolution vector field, we generate a set of streamlines using the same set of seed points. We optimize the network using a combination of the content loss and the streamline loss. We define streamline loss as the Euclidean distance between all the points on the ground truth streamline and the predicted streamline. We define the total loss as a combination of streamline loss and content loss whose respective weights are controlled by the hyperparameter lambda. Our network architecture closely follows the work by Guo et al. where they use five residual blocks and two upsampling blocks. The only difference being we use nearest neighbor of sampling instead of voxel shuffle for simplicity. To generate the streamlines, we use Euler integration scheme. We found through experimentation that uh, Euler integration scheme with sufficiently small step size performed as good as the fourth order Runge Kata integration scheme with um, the training being much faster for uh, Euler integration scheme, thus making it our choice of integration scheme. Since Euler integration scheme can be expressed as a differentiable function with respect to the vector field, and uh, with the use of trilinear interpolation for accessing vectors at arbitrary locations, our pipeline is trained end-to-end -end by backpropagating over the integration scheme. We also need to generate seed points to perform the integration. To this end, we use Zhu et al's entropy-based seeding technique to generate the seed points. First, we calculate the entropy field for a given vector field at all the grid positions, and then we use the generated entropy scalar field as a probability distribution to draw the seed samples from. We further scale the entropy field to allow us to bias towards high entropy regions only uh, or uh, get a more uniform distribution. We control the scaling with the hyperparameter alpha where if alpha is set to minus 1 then we get a more uniform distribution and as we increase the value of alpha to 0 we start biasing it more towards the high entropy regions. We can see uh, on the top right we have the entropy field for one of the time steps of the square cylinder data set. We can see the results of drawing 200 seed points using the scaled entropy field with different alpha values. With alpha set to minus 1, 
we have a more uniform seat point selections whereas with alpha set to zero we only draw from high entropy regions for our training setup we generate 2000 streamlines for every training iterations uh, using the scaled uh, entropy based seeding the network is trained using the generated streamlines along with the content loss we also use adam optimizer and start with a learning rate of 10 to the power minus 4 we use an adaptive learning rate scheduler where we decrease the learning rate by a factor of 0 0.8 every 1000 iterations the network fails to improve on a held out with uh, validation set. We use two different evaluation metrics to evaluate our model. We use peak signal to noise ratio to determine the quality of super resolution vector field as compared to the ground truth high resolution vector field. We introduce another evaluation metric to determine uh, how good the streamlines generated from super resolution vector field uh, are as compared to the streamlines generated from the ground truth vector field. We call it ALP, that is average last position loss of streamlines. We take the uh, Euclidean distance between the position of the last point on the streamline generated from the super resolution vector field and the position of the last point uh, of the streamline generated from the ground truth vector field. Since errors accumulate quite easily when calculating streamlines, the position of the last point on, a predict, uh, on, a, on the predicted streamline can indicate how much it deviated from the uh, last point position of the ground truth streamline. Next, we perform an extensive hyperparameter study to identify how these parameters affect the training process. First, we study the hyperparameter alpha. We vary the value of alpha generating seed points from different distributions and then train the network on a synthetic tornado dataset. From the table, we can observe that there is a trade-off between the PSNR and the ALP values. As we increase the value of alpha, that is bias the seed, uh, to seed sampling towards the high entropy regions, we can see an improvement in the ALP values. This can be attributed to the fact that high entropy regions have more complex streamlines and thus optimizing on them specifically leads to a boost in ALP values. However, this boost comes at the cost of PSNR. We observe that the alpha value of minus 0.01 gives a good balance between PSNR and ALP and thus is our choice of hyperparameter for all the experiments. Next we study the effect of lambda parameter on training. The lambda parameter controls the weight on streamline and content loss. When lambda is set to zero, we train, on using, uh, we train only using the content loss whereas when lambda is set to 1, we train only using the streamline loss. In both the cases, we can see that we are either achieving a high PSNR or a high ALP value respectively. From the table, we can see that lambda set to 0 0.5 gives a good balance between PSNR and ALP and is thus our choice of hyperparameter. A crucial part of incorporating streamline into the optimization process is to determine uh, how long we want to integrate the streamlines. Streamline length is the number of steps we take during the integration to get the streamline. We study this parameter by taking short, that is streamlines of length only 150 and longer streamlines, that is streamlines of length 400. We train different models on different streamline length and for these models, we evaluated, evaluated them on different lengths irrespective of the length they were trained on. The idea is to identify whether the model trained on smaller streamline can faithfully preserve uh, longer streamlines and vice versa. That is, if model is trained on a longer streamline, can they faithfully preserve strong, uh, smaller streamlines? 
From the table, we can see that models trained on longer, smaller streamlines, uh, like length 150 and 250, uh, tend to not do as well when evaluated on longer streamlines. We can see that streamline length of 350 generalizes well when evaluated across different streamline lengths and thus is our choice of streamline length. We use trilinear interpolation and a model trained only on content loss keeping the network architecture same as baselines to compare against our model. We quantitatively evaluate our model trained on three different datasets and compare it against the baselines. We can see that the model clearly we can see that uh, our model clearly outperforms the baselines in terms of PSNR and ALP values. The only exception being tornado dataset where the uh, content loss has a better PSNR than our model. However, the ALP value for Tornado dataset indicates that IAVFS preserves streamlines much more faithfully than the baseline. We qualitatively evaluate our model too. The top row shows the uh, qualitative results for the square cylinder dataset. We can see the differences being highlighted in yellow. Clearly IAVFS captures the uh, spiral streamlines much more faithfully than the baselines. And also we do not see uh, the artifacts that uh, the model trained with content loss uh, has and it does not actually exist in the ground truth. Similar, similar observations are made for the Tangero dataset as well. We can see that IAVFS preserves streamlines much more faithfully than the baselines. With trilinear interpolation, the streamline either ends too early or is entirely missing, whereas the model trained with content loss introduces additional streamlines which do not actually exist in the ground truth. We proposed an integration-aware vector field super resolution technique for 3D vector fields. We believe this work is an important step towards integrating visualization aspects of vector field into the optimization process. We have thus far only considered very few datasets and uh, only experimented with a scale factor of 4. For our future work, we would like to scale this up and try on larger datasets with larger downscaling factor. Uh, also, we would like to take into consideration the temporal coherence of, the, uh, of unsteady vector fields and not just focus on spatial uh, super resolution. Thank you. Any questions? So we have uh, already two questions from the audience. Uh, the first question from Sebastian Weiss, I think you can read also in the chat, how many time steps are used for integrating the streamline? So that and Sebastian later said, okay, this first part was already answered. I think you mentioned something like between 150 and, and 300, but the next part of the question of Sebastian is, as normal backpropagation requires storing all intermediate visits, what are the memory requirements for training? Okay, so for different data sets, we set up the training in such a way that we were taking every fourth time step. So if a data set has like 50 time steps, we were taking like first and then the fourth and then the eighth time step for training and the uh, remaining time steps for you were used for uh, testing. Uh, from the testing set, we uh, randomly selected few of the time steps for validation. Uh, uh, as for memory requirements, yeah, it is memory extensive. So uh, if we have uh, vector fields that are huge in size, we cannot fit them in memory and you have to take uh, crops of the vector fields, like take smaller crops and then train the network accordingly. Okay. Uh, thank you. So we have a que question from Ingrid Hotz. When comparing the method to a pure vector-based reconstruction method, shouldn't one make sure that the computational effort in the training phase is the same in both cases? This might not be given if you only consider the number of streamlines. Uh, that is a good question, but... Uh... 
uh, including the streamline would uh, incorporate some additional uh, computational uh, expense, which we cannot, uh, like when training a model with content loss, we do not have those uh, additional expense. But uh, yeah, if we think about it uh, in terms of how much uh, computational effort requires, then our technique requires more computational effort than a normal like a model that's trained on only on content loss. Okay, and then uh, I know we are two minutes out of time, but still we have one quick question. Have you from Sebastian Weiss? Have you studied the effect of integration errors on the training and reconstruction quality? For example, larger time step versus smaller time steps. Okay, can you please repeat that? Okay. Have you studied the effect of integration errors on the training and reconstructing quality? I mean, if you use uh, larger time steps or smaller time step, then you have either a, a larger or a smaller integration error. And what is the impact of this on the training? Oh, that's a good question. But uh, yeah, we, we did not explore uh, how that affects. Uh, we, we took a sufficiently small uh, step size and uh, evaluated our method, but yeah. That's, that that's will be good... for future works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Saroj, again. So we need to move on to the next talk. Okay, so we had uh, four very interesting talks, and I am sure the last one will be as interesting. So the title of the last talk is Selection of Optimal Salient Time Steps by Non-Negative Tucker Tensor decomposition. And the talk will be given by Jesus Polido from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Hello, uh, welcome to our talk. I'm Jesus Polido. I'm a staff scientist at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And uh, today I'll be giving a talk on our work on selection of optimal salient time steps by non-negative Tucker tensor decomposition. In large simulations, outputs are frequently high spatial resolution time steps, typically sampled regularly in simulated time, leaving hundreds or thousands of time steps on persistent storage resulting in terabytes to petabytes of data to read and process for summary results. In this work, we are interested in identifying a subset of key time steps, otherwise known as salient time steps, that efficiently represent an entire time series. This subset can both be used for developing visualization parameters to process the entire time series, to use as keyframes to summarize important moments in the simulation, and to more efficiently communicate to collaborators key time steps worth investing further analysis. A variety of techniques exist for identifying keyframes, of which we compare in this work. The most trivial method for selecting time steps from a simulation is to pick every end cycle from the simulation or a random selection process. This method is most commonly used in AMR codes or Lagrangian codes, where the cell sizes can change from time step to time step. An entropy-based selection is an information theory approach that isolates time steps with the highest entropy and therefore selected as keyframes. Wavelets for keyframe selection typically use a Haar basis function, where a multi-scale wavelet decomposition is performed for every keyframe for all keyframes in a data set. The product of this transform, a series of wavy coefficients, are then measured for high rates of change of which they represent keyframes. A more recent approach involves performing k-means clustering on the fine coefficients to target a k number of clusters which result in a k number of frames. The unique floating point binning method creates a series of floating point bins, usually by four or five significant digits, of which the number of unique cell values are counted and the time steps with the most bin quantities are selected as keyframes. Finally, NNTD is a novel method introduced in this work. The non-negative Tucker tensor decomposition is a new unsupervised learning method uh, for finding such salient time steps. Here, we give a visual example on the types of distributions for the asteroid impact dataset of which we examine closer later in the talk. Regular and random samples show that their behavior as expected up top. Methods such as entropy-based, wavelets with coefficient detection, and the unique flux approach 
are biased towards initial keyframes due to the large initial introduction of entropy in the system. Finally, more complex methods such as wavelets plus k-means and NNTF select both some initial frames and intermediate frames. When processing large data, it's often difficult to link directly the data to the parameters of the generating processes. Typically, the underlying features remain unobserved, hidden, or latent. Extracting these latent features not only reveals valuable information about hidden causality and mechanisms, but it also reduces the dimensionality by revealing these low dimensional latent structures that represent the whole data set. There are several tools used previously for latent feature extraction, such as PCA, ICA, and NMF. In NMF or non-negative matrix factorization, the presence of the non-negativity constraint makes the extracted latent features physically interpretable. Since many quantities such as pixels, density, velocity, etc. are naturally non-negative, the extracted features will not have physical meaning if the non-negativity is not in place. Because most datasets are high-dimensional in nature, they are represented by tensors instead or multi-dimensional arrays. When extracting tensor features, they typically describe multiple concurrent lane processes in each different dimension. This tensor factorization, which is the higher dimensional analog of matrix factorization, is an unsupervised learning method that represents a cutting edge approach for feature analysis. In this illustration, we show our use of the non-negative Tucker 1 decomposition, or NTD1, for a three-dimensional tensor. In the first row, NTD1 unfolds an input four-dimensional tensor into a 2D representation as A. As seen in the second row, NTD1 uses NMF to extract the latent structure of A, resulting in components W and H, such that the product of these two non-negative factor matrices can approximate A. To further describe these components, the K columns in W represent the latent time features, while the K columns in the transpose matrix H correspond to the space factors. After the extraction of W and H, we can reshape the matrix H to reconstruct the three-dimensional tensor seen in the bottom row of the illustration, where each reshaped matrix corresponds to a three-dimensional space feature. To perform salient time step selection, we select the keyframes that are the most strongly associated with each space feature. This can be accessed by looking at the index of the largest value in each of the K columns in W providing us with the target K number of interpretable features. To evaluate the quality of a fully reconstructed temporal data set from a number of keyframes, we propose the use of traditional statistical metrics and image quality metrics with key differences between the two. Metrics such as total absolute error, mean square error, peak signal to noise ratio, and signal to noise ratio aim in measuring differences between the two data points or cells of the original versus the approximated data sets. On the other hand, visual quality metrics such as the structural similarity index measure, the multi-scale structural similarity index measure, and the universal image quality index quantify similarities between data points and are typically standardized between values of 0 and 1. These two different properties can be seen in the example below where on the left, you have a higher PSNR, but lower SSIM. And on the right, you have a lower PSNR and higher SSIM. One measuring key differences between data points and the other measuring key similarities between data points. Having defined our series of metrics, we would like to evaluate the quality of K. First, we select the best K keyframes where k is less than the n total number of simulation steps. Then, we interpolate intermediate frames to the nearest selected k keyframes, where missing star and n frames are set equal to the nearest k. Once reconstruction is complete, we compute the statistical and visual quality metrics on the original time series versus the approximated time series. To measure the quality, we want to ideally maximize PSNR, SNR, SSIM, MS, SSIM, and UQI. Likewise, we'd like to minimize the TAE, or total absolute error, and MSC quantities. The Deepwater Impact Ensemble dataset is a set of x ray lano simulations created to study the propensity of asteroids impacting deep ocean water to create tsunamis. 
For our test, we used the YB31 ensemble member that consisted of a resampling of the AMR data onto a regular grid and has 269 time steps. For this analysis, we decided to extract the best k equals 19 keyframes. k equals 19 to signify regular intervals throughout the data set, or about 1 in every 15 keyframes, so that we could perform a baseline comparison with regular sampling. When looking at the Deepwater Impact dataset, we found NNTF to excel in image quality metrics compared to the other methods. When examining regular sampling, usually the default choice, one could say it presents numerically the best possible case to get an overall view of a simulation, but image quality metrics say otherwise. When focusing on image quality metrics towards the right column of the table, we found wavelets plus k-means and NNTF to excel in image quality metrics while introducing a small amount of numerical error. As explained in the previous slide, image quality algorithm metrics focus on capturing visual similarities rather than numerical differences between datasets, therefore making these keyframe selection methods more desirable in visualization. For our second evaluation, we use the ABUMIP land ice modeling dataset, which investigates an extreme scenario where all ice shelves around Antarctica are removed instantaneously and are prevented from reforming over a period of 500 years. Generated using the MPAS Albany land ice simulation code, this dataset consists of 1.8 million grid cells in the horizontal over 200 time steps. For the land ice simulation, although the dataset is structurally different than the impact dataset, so a one-dimensional horizontal dataset versus a regular three-dimensional gridded dataset, we observe similar quality behavior as before. Having processed the selection methods on the raw floating point surface data, we found once again that NNTF produces the best image quality metrics compared to the other keyframe selection methods. As NNTF came out on top, we still found all the other methods to generally perform well in image quality metrics. As you can see, SSIM is typically greater than 0.89. This can be attributed to the slowly evolving numerical data in the original dataset, where hardly any significant changes occur compared to the asteroid impact dataset. In this work, we've shown our initial results in keyframe selection methods for explorative visualization. We introduced a set of evaluation criteria that considers both statistical and image quality metrics for keyframe quality evaluation. We show that non-negative Tucker factorization and NTF produces some of the best visual quality metric results compared to other traditional methods in keyframe selection. Although traditional selection methods may have lower numerical error, we found that they may not have the best visual quality metrics relevant for visual applications and visualization. For future work, we'd like to perform a more thorough analysis on the case selection process that goes beyond k equals 19. We will continue improving the efficiency of this method beyond the prototype phase to expand it to full 3D simulation datasets and not just subsets. We've already made some improvements and you can find the code at the GitHub link below. Finally, we'd like to apply NFTF results to perform data compression and explore full-time series simulation reconstructions. This research was funded by the Lano Laboratory Directed Research and Development LDRD grant and the Los Alamos National Laboratory Institutional Computing Program supported by the U.S. Department of Energy and NSA. You can find our code repository at https github.com slash lano slash pi dnmfk. Thank you for listening to my talk. Okay, thank you, Jesus. Very nice talk. And I see that your code is available on GitHub. So is, is that right? Uh, yes. So uh, this is uh, some of the code that's been uh, improved on. So this is the main uh, NNTF method. Um, we've, we went ahead and, and we uploaded the, the code onto GitHub a bit after uh, the acceptance of the paper. So we were working up until up until basically now to get the code up and running. And uh, since the, the code was introduced in the paper, uh, we've made improvements to the performance of the code. So initially when the paper was written, this is still very early work, uh, ongoing work. Uh, so it wasn't as performant as it is now. So it should be a bit more fairly optimized to, to run and test on, on different applications. Okay. This, so is, we... this is one example application that we tried it on. That, that, that's really great. And we thank you for that. Um, I have a, a specific question. I understand that your method is quite automatic. So you give the data set and, and at the output, you have the, the time steps. Would it be uh, possible to uh, 
I mean, tuned to guide the way the time steps are extracted. Maybe if you would like to see some specific features and so would it be possible? Um, at, at the moment, uh, the only sort the only input given to to the framework would be this number K. Uh, and for this analysis, this initial work, we selected K equals 19 uh, for the purpose of we want to mainly focus on sort of the, the baseline regular, uh, like regular sampling of say a, two, a 200 time step simulation. You wanna evenly sample it through. So we, we picked uh, 19 or, or 20. Um, so that was sort of the initial guidance there. So the case themselves, once you compute the Ks and you compute the K time steps, you're able to sort them by a, a certain quantity. Uh, so then if you want to present the top Ks, um, you're able to sort them and, and present them to, to the researcher or the scientists in an order in an orderly fashion, which the, th the top Ks should be the most important in terms of the most sort of dynamic or okay. most unique features. I understand. So uh, if I understand correctly, uh, there is no notion of viewpoint in the way you extract the time step. Is that, is that right? Or do you take into consideration some viewpoints Oh, not at all. Uh, not at all. So we run we run this on the raw data itself. Yeah. Uh, for the purpose of then taking these k time steps and then trying to visualize them. So the main purpose, the the the, the reason this all came up was, say, you have this massive simulation, yeah. uh, you haven't visualized it yet, but you want to create a nice, say, production visualization movie, a nice visualization. Uh, before you even run the visualization and load the data. You want to run this this pre initial analysis to first select the, the top k relevant points yeah, I, I, and then I, I, visualize. So, it. The, but I I imagine that in some cases maybe um, from a global point of view you have a very, the best time steps. But maybe in some tiny place, if you go on bottom right, there is one place that we have a very interesting feature. Could could it be the case that that something like that happens? Uh, and, yes. And in that case, you will not extract this this time set. Uh, exactly. Yes. And, and uh, I don't think we mentioned it as part of a future work. So we did want to do visualization specific analysis with, with this system. So once you say, once you've already visualized it and you want to look within the, visual, the visualizations themselves, then you could run this analysis again on top of that. Uh, and then in that case, if you do have a, a, an interesting specific feature in visualization space, uh, then we'll, we could go ahead and try to find that as well. So, right. Uh, yes, it, it's not in the current system, but yes, it, it's not out of the picture of 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 trying. Right. So we have one question from Ingrid Hotz. Have you an idea how sensitive the method would be to noisy data? Uh, not really. Um, so this simulation data that we've ran on isn't inherently noisy, so we can't really say. Uh, I, I can't say right away on how this would look like with just noisy data. I think noisy uh, data, you add random noise. Um, I think one of your colleagues is pretty much sure that the method is pretty robust with noisy data as well. We yes. can see on the desktop <laughs> channel. OK, I don't have it open. But yes, one of, one of the co-authors, the colleagues, is, yeah. in, is in the chat who could also answer questions after, after this. Okay. But it, yes, yeah, so it should be robust enough uh, to, to run on noisy. I haven't personally ran it, so he might have ran it uh, on, on noisy data. So. Okay. Yes, that, that's the case. Well, thank, thank you again, Rezos, for, for this uh, answers. Okay. So I mean, I, I'm supposed to close the session now? Yes? OK, let, let, let's close the session now. So at the beginning of the session, I said short paper session are always uh, entertaining. We find new ideas, original ideas in a quick, uh, quick way. And uh, I think we can all agree that I was right. We had five uh, very interesting talks with new ideas, some uh, related ideas between talks. And I hope you have all enjoyed this, uh, this session as, as much as I've done. So I thank you again to all five authors of this great paper. And I hope to see you in for real someday soon, hopefully. Goodbye to all of you. Bye-bye. Have a nice uh, day for some of you or night for others. <laughs> Goodbye. Auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss.